Okay, so the topic today is taking off our rose colored glasses and finding there are many practical things we can do. So what we're going to give you today is the fact that a stellium of planets are coming into Virgo. And we want to hold this consciously because what happens with Virgo is you start to get very nervous in your stomach. A lot of anxiety can come up. The last couple of days as the planets have been going into Virgo, I'm going, oh my gosh, I feel anxious. I almost feel panicked. So in this Zoom conference, we wanna give you a lot of very practical things to do while the rose colored glasses are coming off because this month we will also have the last of the squares really tightly starting to square between um, Jupiter and Neptune. And when all of those planets go into Virgo, it's going to be a really, really almost tense crisis type of feeling um, T-square. So we're going to give you some practical things to do and explain what Virgo feels like. Interestingly, um, before the call, Emmeline was talking about doing a liver cleanse. And if you don't have an outlet, if you don't have something that you can actually take action on, all of that anxiety builds up in the kidney and the liver. Um, if you're really angry about what's going on with the planet, it will definitely start to build up in the liver. So who knows where this conversation will go? We might even get into how to do a liver cleanse. I don't really know. But what I want um, our listeners to know is that if this conversation brings up a lot of fear or wounding or um, you know, people, people feel concerned about what they should be saying, that they will be somehow judged, this is not about judging anything. It's about just offering the astrology and our experience. And what we all have on this whole planet is something called the crucifixion wound. So the crucifixion wound is that if I say that, I will be crucified. And I'm reading um, a book right now called Magdalene Rising. And Holly and I were just talking about the fact that Magdalene and the asteroid Magdalene and the asteroid Amor, the love of Magdalene, are traveling with the North Node in Cancer right now. This is a really profound book. Anyone who wants to get this book, Magdalene Rising, it's about Magdalene's background, that she came from this Isle of Women, and she had no inhibitions whatsoever because she had grown up in this Celtic culture of women. And so when she meets who she calls Asus or Yeshua, she's writing his name in her menstrual blood on a rock which to the Jews was like unclean. So he was horrified because she was unclean. And it's really, really funny because the other thing about Magdalene is that she learned, she grew up with women who could debate. They could really argue. They could get like hot tempered and they would even fight. And they were warrior women. So, it was very interesting. She was like the ultimate gent gentile or gentile and unclean. <laughs> and when she met Yeshua, he was like, oh no, the one God. And she's going, oh no, we have Bridget and we have the God of the sea. And we have So just take out any crucifixion wound that is in you about not feeling like you can say anything that you want to say, because the only way we can get to what we need to get to is say anything that we want to say. Um, and you can consult with a good shaman. I know Holly has done her shamanist, shamanistic uh, training. Anybody who can help you do a ceremony to release that crucifixion wound, or you just do it yourself and say, I'm not gonna be crucified by anybody's judgment. Okay, so that's the important thing because with Virgo, Virgo can feel very criticized. Virgo can feel that if they're not meticulous and perfect and well-organized and have all the details down, 
they feel criticized. And to be able to talk about something is to be able to also let go of feeling like hypercritical, like everyone's looking at me, everyone's talking about what she said or what experience that person had or what they offered. Just let it go, okay? Whew. All right, now let's talk about the Virgo Pisces axis. So when I think about Virgo, I think about the perfect seed. And one of the tools that I have um, is this calendar. And you can see, here's the, the grain, okay? The goddess of the grain. And this is a witch's calendar. And yes, I have a witch's calendar, of course. And what this gives you is every single day when the moon is changing, the phase, the void, of course, and when the planets go into a new sign. That's one of the tools that you can have with Virgo that helps you get the details down. Virgo likes the exact time. They like to know the exact details. They want to be organized with the information that the moon is in that today. They're very good at anal analytically figuring out a linear structure of how things are gonna work. Now, if you're not like that, it can feel extremely anxious right now, going, whoa, there's a lot of unknown things happening right now. So I'm gonna give you a lot of things that we can do in the positive side of these Virgo details. Pisces, on the other side, which is the last sign in the zodiac, meaning that the opposition is actually building to be the strongest opposition that there is in the zodiac. Pisces says, let go of the details. It doesn't matter. Just go with the flow. Let's just be cosmically connected and everything will work out just fine. And Neptune, which in modern astrology has been assigned to be the ruler of Pisces when we first started figuring out there are more planets. Neptune is there going, it's all a fantasy anyways. This is just your imagination. Just vision whatever you want. And that can be your fantasy because we're all living in a simulation anyways. Okay, so you can hear that, right? Whereas Virgo, particularly because Mars entered first, which I hope that the group can talk about the fact of the, the way the planets are entering Virgo. Mars entered first. And as soon as Mars entered, crisis. Okay. And I knew there was going to be some crisis and I didn't know what it was. I, I really couldn't figure it out. I knew some crisis was coming. So when Mars entered, we heard about fires actually planet-wide most people are talking about the fires in the amazon but siberia is on fire also so mars entered and said you want to see the details i'm gonna show you what i've got okay and virgo's going wait we need material security whoa mars this don't create so much destruction. And Mars is going, I've got a way to show you how to get the details down. I'm going to scare the crap out of all of you. <laughs> okay. Cause Mars often will work like that. Mars is a warrior and Mars doesn't really care if you're comfortable about that. And Virgo does not like to be disrupted that way. So the other thing that I've realized now is Mars is trining uranus who is hot and electrical so when mars entered virgo and uranus was retrograding in taurus the two of them became like earth crisis okay because taurus is like the sensual earth so if you just take it objectively like that everybody who's listening it's like we know that this is happening and we kind of knew it was coming because those earth changes are being shown. They were predicted, and not that I'm a predictor, but the energies are there to look at it. So then the whole stellium coming across through Virgil is like, okay, 
that's happening, what can you practically do every single day to do your part to be on planet Earth and be in the sacred marriage with Gaia, with her earthly structures, with her material security? That's what Virgo really wants. Juno just entered today, the sacred marriage bed. Like, how do you have this love of Gaia and marry the, the part of you that wants to be here growing the corn and the grain and the beans and the squash? Okay. Now I'm just going to use the comparison that we have to understand is that in my experience over the years, I've heard people say to me, I will not eat 3D food. I don't care about your 3D food. And so I'm going, but you're on earth. Well, I'm just going to smoke my cigarettes and eat cookies. And I, I'm going, wow, okay, yes, go ahead. But what Virgo is saying to us is, you're on earth. Grow your beans. You're on earth. Get those material details down of embodiment here. And take off the rose-colored glasses because Neptune is very much like, I'm not doing it. I'm going back to the cosmos. I am only eating that food that comes from the cosmos. And then what happens is the physical structures of your earthly body might be breaking down. Your liver, if you smoke cigarettes and eat cookies <laughs> every day because you're not eating any 3D food, your liver is going to be in trouble pretty soon. Okay? So that's the thing. Take off the rose-colored glasses and get into the details of what it's like to live on earth. So I can go on and on, of course, because I've got a lot of props for this conversation, but I want to hear what the other group members have to say. What is the feeling that's been happening for you? And what is it that practically needs to happen in your particular life, given where Virgo and Pisces are in your chart? Well, I'll talk a little bit about it. Virgo is right at the bottom of my chart in the fourth house of home, um, physical location of my home, family, ancestry. And um, so Virgo is is a very like familiar feeling for me. It's, it's kind of like, um, it's, you know, agricultural and countryside and it is for me because this is where my you know it's my ancestry where we had a small homesteader farm um you know it's that place of surviving on our own and surviving off the land and so for me like mars is interesting when mars moved out of leo and into virgo i was really got feeling passionate about that again and you know it's, it's been you know i had kind of downsized things i got rid of some farm animals because i didn't um, feel like I had the time, but I started feeling like I missed it and was really thinking about the, the, that polarity between Pisces and, and Virgo, that re real life experience and then kind of that dream. And for me, the dream is all different kinds of, of, of paradise, paradise with the animals, paradise of just having everything that I need, and then feeling like that energy of, okay, maybe I need to put um, some more energy in a different direction to really kind of get what I want and for me I can feel that frustration too of from being in the Virgo place which is much more familiar to me than Pisces of seeing that Pisces dream and being frustrated that I can't get it or I can't always get that ideal um, vision that I have in my head um, and so it kind of like bounces back and forth some we, we've talked a little bit about that mirroring thing of that's that vision that I want and then trying to figure out all the little steps and details on how to get what I want. And then when it doesn't happen, dealing with that frustration that it doesn't happen. And for me, Mars coming into that place kind of just amps up that feeling of I've got to go for it. And I'm, but when it doesn't work out, I get really frustrated. And when things get crazy or it makes me feel anxious. Um, I also kind of work in a medical office and it seemed like, as these planets have been moving out of Leo, where they've been having a nice amplification trine with Jupiter, 
Sagittarius, fire to fire that feels very warm and optimistic and the energy feels very congruent and they're moving into Virgo, which squares Jupiter in Sagittarius. It feels like, okay, that optimism is still there, but now it's just a little bit harder, more frustrating to get it. People seem to be elite, also seem to be on a hold that I, I'm dealing with more anxious about things, more anxiety ridden. But what about in lots of questions? Whereas when it was in Leo, it was, okay, this sounds good. And now it's, well, what about this? What about that? And about 50 other more questions. My natal moon is in Virgo. So I understand that kind of questioning um, feeling of, okay, well, what about this thing? And what about this? And then thinking five steps ahead to try to get all the details nailed down so that you can meet that kind of standard of perfection. That's the vision in Pisces. With, Mer with that Neptune there, it's, is that dream really what I really want to dream or is it an illusion? And then there's some other things in Pisces right now, like Black Moon Lilith, that are, um, like, is this, this really what you want? Or do you just need to like throw out the whole everything and start from scratch? and redream everything and then go back to the Virgo part and figure out the details. So I don't know what other people's experiences are, but that's fine. Yeah, I'll tie that together. So well said. Um, the Black Moon Lilith part, which hopefully we'll talk a little bit in this group and then also do just a, a separate video on Lilith. But I felt like as soon as Mars started coming towards Virgo, it was like, we got to wait on Lilith. You know, there, there's going to be some serious swings that happen. And um, when Mars went into Virgo, it was a crisis day. And one of those days where people started sending, sending me money for chart readings that I don't even know. Like I would open my email and there was a, I need a chart reading. So that's what was happening for people. They were going into crisis mostly it's a Capricorn ascendant or a Cancer ascendant or those planets there um, because Saturn and Pluto are really putting the hammer down, you know, on the structures that need to change of why these planets are lining up in Virgo right now. What are the structures that really have to change? And I think Black Moon Lilith is going to play a huge part of it, um, Holly, where like the mush that my larva uh, from the monarchs are going through, there's a huge shedding of the skin. There's a huge like mushing of everything that we thought was gonna happen. There's a huge dissolving. Emily, what do you wanna say about this? Um, I, it's, it's interesting you mentioned anxiety and tension because when, when I immediately think of the sun going into Virgo, let alone Mars, Venus, Juno, and Mercury soon, mm -hmm. I feel it in me like, you know, I'm like, okay, okay, that's okay. I have to just take a moment to breathe and then it's okay. And um, so Virgo for me is in the 12th house and um, I have Persephone at like nine degrees. So it, it is like, I do always, it, but it helps me really connect with my subconscious. Um, I've been studying my solo return chart again recently from my birthday last year um, and looking at Virgo in that chart as well, which is in the house of cash, making money. Um, and it's really like for me, and as well being in the 12th house, it mm -hmm. feels like the seed that prepares my whole chart and kind of ends and prepares so it, for this time of year always feels like my life just starts planting kind of mysterious hidden seeds for me. So it's a, it's a time of receiving, I feel, because when I open my heart and trust, all the details that I need come rather than being like, ha, ah, you know, how do I do that? But I, I, I let it come and desire and trust it. Um, I have to keep a tab on my thoughts, I think, though, because a lot of them are really useful. But if I, if I let them kind of 
spiral off in my mind it creates anxiety whereas if I if I journal it down and also what I find recently I've been having a really steady some secure yoga practice of meditation every morning and recently I've been lengthening it because I've just needed more time to breathe and to ground um, oh. and um, yeah so so Mars coming in first I when I see Mars coming in first I think it went through Taurus first earlier this year Mars and we were all saying it's kind of like plowing the way creating this kind of battlefield and then Venus Brilliant. with Mars I saw today exactly this I think when I looked it was exactly the same degrees like 0.05 or something as Mars and I'm like wow so it's like Venus the love like lighting up our passion and, and love for Earth but also Venus is going into fall right in Virgo so it's like but we're also experiencing the fall of that the loss of you know the fires in the Amazon and apparently there's flooding in India as well devastating flooding and Elsewhere in Europe, maybe that was Siberia you mentioned. Um, so, um, so it's all tying in, and then obviously we're coming to that trine in Capricorn, Pluto. So, and it's really exciting to see here we've got Extinction Rebellion going crazy with everything, and there's been protests this week about the Brazilian embassy. Um, they're gearing up for a big thing in October. So it really feels like a lot of that of those seeds yeah yeah why did you disconnect okay so you can hear mm -hmm. emmeline and her process with the 12th house virgo um i also want to just point out that the other thing that happens and hopefully holly will be able to back me up on this because her brain works a little bit better on details than mine does um the order of how the planets are coming into the signs is really potent this year. Mars is really plowing the way. We had Mars in Aries this year in January. It was like January 1st or something. And I was like, there goes Mars. Everything's direct. All the planets are direct right now. And Mars is plowing the way, right? Um, the process of Virgo is to be really careful with the details, like it's got to be a certain way. So Emmeline's 12th house of it's got to be a certain way is in like the morphogenetic field, the collective unconscious, all of those hidden realms. And I have that same thing for a Libra, Libra, it's not a certain way. So then what we're doing is then we transition from Virgo to Libra. Libra's like, I don't care. Just t let's talk about it. Libra's like, I could go that way. I could go that way. It's not a certain way. And that's also my uh, ascendant, which is like, don't believe me because I'm just talking about it. It could be over here. It could be over the here. And that will drive Virgo absolutely nuts. Virgo's like, Will you just tell me what it is that you actually think? And Libra's going, I, it doesn't matter. I just want to talk to you about it. So <laughs> Libra, and that's how the polarities work. Okay, so from Virgo to Pisces, the complete opposition, and then that following of the signs it's also like that. So when all of these planets were in Leo, everyone was going, yeah, woo, yeah. And now when they're going into Virgo, they're going, oh, oh gosh, what are we doing here? Are we doing it right? Okay. What's really potent though about the Virgo stuff is that as soon as we came around to Virgo, we're gonna make those opposition squares and trines. The geometries are gonna get really incredible um, this next month. So I also wanna point out, and then I wanna hear, um, maybe Holly can talk a little bit how Mars was first perfecting in Cancer, conjunct the sun. Um, Emmeline picked up on the fact that Virgo, I'm sorry, um, that Venus just did her perfection in Leo, and now she's entered her 
um, place where she's really uncomfortable, okay? But what Venus likes in Virgo is she likes to make food. Okay, so here's my next prop. I told you I was gonna have props. So Venus in Virgo, she likes to still have her ability to be creative and enjoy sensual life. In Virgo, Venus will like to make things that are yummy material security, because that's what Virgo really is. It's about the homestead. It's about the land base. It's about the material security. So the other thing that I would suggest to people to do this month is do something that's based on food. Do a liver cleanse. Put away some pickles. Uh, create something that, like uh, Emmeline was saying, a practice of yoga or a longer time to breathe or more time outside in nature. Those are very practical things that you can do when it starts to feel anxious and tense. Okay. Um, Holly, can you talk at all about how, what it is about the fact that Mars perfected in Cancer and then Mars is going to be combust the sun also in Virgo? What do you think that means? Well, I think, well, when Mars was in Cancer, Cancer is the house of fall for Mars. So it is where it has the greatest challenge. Um, Mars is fiery energy and its area of rulership is um, Aries and Scorpio. And it's also very strong in Capricorn where it's exalted. So these places that are either very fiery or, or very kind of physical. Um, but that's not what cancer is. Cancer is soft and watery and nurturing. And so that is a place where Mars has to really mature and become a more full spectrum of energies and learn how to utilize its energy in a territory that's very um, not um, suited for. So where it, Mars has to understand how to, you know, be that kind of fiery passion in a very sensitive emotional place. So that can either be kind of very um, frustrating or victim minded, or it can produce with some evolution and maturity, someone who is very protective and um, sensitive, but can also stand up for themselves and is no longer so victim minded. Um, and having the sun go, you know, be perfect with the sun in cancer is kind of burns off anything that's really holding that back and kind of distills that. And Mars was also what they call out of bounds in, in cancer, where it is outside that um, 15 degree boundary of the path of the sun that travels. So it kind of goes up into the um, more into the cosmic space. It gets a little bit more of a cosmic perspective before dipping back down into the ecliptic or the path of the sun. So there, while um, Mars transited Cancer, it got a bit of a, a chance to upgrade and evolve and then moved into an energy of Leo that it's more comfortable with to kind of settle those energies, become, take that kind of sensitivity that it learned in Cancer and move into Leo that where it's more playful, it, ha it could be more fiery, but you know, it's more comfortable before going into Virgo, where it's a little bit that neutral thing, but it's, you know, it's not in fall, it's not exalted, but it's a neutral place, but it's like, okay, this is where you kind of put this new changes that you've been kind of encoded in Cancer into um into practice into reality in the most physically perhaps physically real detailed place in the zodiac which is virgo um and it's and now that it's going to come and conjunct the sun again here and virgo is that second pass of really kind of either um energizing anything that really needs to be there or burning off anything that is left behind and the same thing with the venus venus is, will now be conjunct the sun 
anything that you know that needs to be purified out of the, the kind of the Venus template at this time gets burned off and you know she's not especially not comfortable in Virgo as Lolita said so this is where she can be a bit dreamy sometimes Venus has a, a reputation of being lazy and Virgo is about hard work at times so this is where you chop wood and carry water to get enlightenment um, you know, this is Venus is like, okay, I, I know you want to have a soiree in, uh, you know, <laughs> and lounge around and eat pastries and, you know, sip tea and, you know, cocktails with your friends, but you got to work hard. So anything in, in kind of Venus template that needs to be balanced out by taking a dip into like the, the Virgo, um, you know, full spectrum reality in the physical um, is what I see is happening. So. That was so well said, Holly. Just absolutely. I, that's, I'm so really blessed to have this group because as a Libra ascendant, I need to interact. You know, I need to hear everybody's point of view. Um, and that, and that is how we get the details down, in my opinion. You know, so when the nodes are moving backwards, that's also very interesting to me because, you know, you can have a node in Libra and then it's going to move backwards into Virgo because in, a, in an interesting way, we're also needing to return to information in order to move forward to information. And so the nodes always moving backwards is me just thinking like, we always need to return. And one of those things that um, Holly's talking about is Virgo is that really good old chop wood, carry water to enlightenment. Whereas Neptune is going, doesn't really matter. It's all enlightenment anyways. We're all in the ocean of bliss. And Neptune is going, of course you're in an ocean of bliss. Let me give you another illusion about how blissful it is. Let, here's another illusion. How about this one? And Mars perfecting with the sun in Virgo is gonna make an opposition to Neptune. And Mars is gonna be like, hammer down people, hammer down. Okay, let's get some details here and perfect ourselves carrying wood and not chopping water, but carrying water too. <laughs> so um, during this month, try and find those kind of practical things to do. Now, the next thing I want to bring up as a topic, and we can also just jump back into the, you know, the order, the way the planets are going in, is um, one of our group members, Laura, wrote a really fabulous piece about the sacred mirror. So when we talk about our life, we can't be outside of the examples of our experience, okay? So in the examples of our experience, everything is a sacred mirror. Everything is a sacred mirror. So one of the things that I saw pop up um, was as soon as the fire started in Amazon, the politicians started to say, oh, I'm going to cut greenhouses, greenhouse gas by that and that and that. I'm going to do that and that and that for you. I'm going to make sure that and that and that happens. Now that is Neptune and Pisces, as far as I'm concerned, because that's like that Messiah syndrome, that somehow that that politician is going to jump onto that fire in the Amazon and say, oh, but my platform is this pie in the sky example of how we're going to cut greenhouse gases. Now the way that Virgo works, which is my South node. So I have like a lot of experience with it is that Virgo does not believe those pie in the sky things. They're going to chop their own wood and carry their own water. So the sacred mirror that's happening with the earth changes is each person's personal responsibility. And this is where I get very unpopular because Virgo is my South node. And I can be like, ah, but where did you chop wood and carry water? But where did you 
make sure that you had the details down. So I'm gonna just give some examples. Here's my new business idea. Does anyone know what these are? <laughs> yeah, you know, we sell those here. I don't sell them, but yeah, we use the sanitary pads, right? Yes. So when there is, I told you I was gonna have Virgo details this time. When there is this pie in the sky thing out there of, I'm gonna cut greenhouse gases. I'm going, I'm gonna be wearing reusable sanitary pads and making them. And I've been wearing these for 20 years. You can sell them at your local co-op, your local farmer's market, your craft league, and you just, practical ideas, make these little butterfly wings, put them on a double thick piece of cotton, and put a snap on it that snaps. I have literally been wearing these for 20 years and I am literally wearing one now. And if that offends you, I'm sorry. But these are, these are my details. And because I'm so inspired by this book, you know, the whole blood ritual is that you can wash this thing in a bucket and go water your garden. These are the details. Okay, these are the kind of things that we can do. Because if the Amazon's burning, that's me burning. That is my sacred mirror. And I also saw on social media, media a lot of, you know, it's that president's fault, it's that president's fault, it's that Republican, it's that conservative agenda, it's McDonald's, it's Burger King, it's, it's you know, I saw a lot. And I'm not saying it's not. It, it is that too, but Virgo wants to know exactly what I am doing for the details. What am I doing? What is my sacred mirror? So the next prop I have for everyone is my toilet paper. Because as much, and, and again, this is not a shame or blame or judgment, anything. But as much as I want to say that it's McDonald's, it's Burger King, it's that politician's problem, it's that I wipe with toilet paper. And that 740,000 trees apparently are saved by 50% post-consumer recycled paper. Okay. Now, even when I was in college way back in the early... 90s, the late 80s, I refused to get the New York Times, even though I was a political science major and I was supposed to be reading the New York Times every day. And back then we didn't have internet, so you couldn't get it on the internet. 500,000 trees are cut down every single day for the New York Times. 500,000 trees. And I protested that way back then. Because I said, look, you know why, this thing is this thick. The New York Times, have you ever picked one up? It's, it's thick. And when I talked to my daughter about this, she's like, oh, nobody gets the New York Times anymore. I'm like, good, good, <laughs> fabulous. Um, there's this other piece that I want to pull out um, that is actually an unbelievable advantage right now of Neptune being in Pisces that I have found to be incredibly useful for the planet. When I was riding my bike yesterday with Claude, we were going all through the rail trail in New Hampshire out to Canaan. And all the fields were unmowed. The, the edges were not weed whacked. The, um, the edges of the roads were not weed whacked. They were all like the milkweed and um, the different pollinator plants that are wild. What's amazing about the natural process of Neptune being in Pisces is that everybody's in such a dream that you can hardly find anyone to do labor anymore. <laughs> um, 
this year the local um, like cutting up of your lawn uh, weed whacking service here in Vermont called Chippers cannot find anyone to weed whack. They're, they have no staff of weed whackers, zero, which has never happened in the 20 years that I've been here. So all the roadsides and all the fields are covered with lots of wild, crazy plants, including poison parsnip, which is not so convenient. But um, the butterflies and the larva are like crazy this year. So there is some default goodness about Neptune being in Pisces where people are just going, no, I can't do it. I can't bag groceries. No, I can't. No, I can't pick up a weed whacker. Because what I'm finding is the young people, generally in their 30s, who would be great, like hefty weed whacker guys, are just refusing to do it. They will not bag groceries. They will not do the weed whacking. They will not do the details. They are physically actually not able to do it. So that by default, there's tons of butterflies this year. So there's something very also natural about the um, Neptune and Pisces fantasy world that is helpful to our planet right now. And we should look at into those things too, like where is Neptune and Pisces really doing well, is that some people are refusing to do the details. Tons and tons of people are unemployed and not willing to work. That's also amazing. So they're kind of bucking the system in that way. Oh, that's fabulous. A really different way of looking at that living on cloud nine kind of Neptune and Pisces wearing rose colored glasses and thinking, oh, it's all going to work out. Now, I'll see if you guys want to say anything about that. Could be about my toilet paper, my sanitary pads, whatever you want to talk about. So. I, I was thinking um, with the Neptune and Pisces opposite Virgo and how that balance of feeling you're in this cosmic bliss and the connection to ourselves because in that unity we connect with our true self and the cosmic self and the parallel lives and all of this kind of stuff but then with Virgo it's amazing because it's polarizing with the sun being like get into Virgo and then it's like for me I'm finding it's saying materialize yourself now like stop it like you're not meant to be lost in a cloud. And I really felt very challenged by that. It's like, I'm like, oh, I have all these things about me and all these things, these dreams and all these understandings about who I am that I get to enjoy. And Virgo is like, yeah, but you're meant to be here materializing it so you can give it to other people and help the planet. So I'm like, how can I, well, I'm doing it anyway, but it's like just really focusing on it. Um, so it's such a good opportunity to bring all the Neptunian wisdom into the now and into the real where it isn't an illusion anymore because it has to be tangible. So it can't be an illusion because you can see through it then. Anything, it's almost like, can we transfer into reality and see what's real and what isn't real and everything else will just fall away because we're kind of like popping it over from one to the other, like sorting it out. Um, and then I guess if we're wrong, we're wrong, but at least we're figuring it out. And the loop paper is amazing. I was going to buy some of that today. <laughs> so I'm on the same track. <laughs> Things like toothpaste. We get a lot of natural toothpaste. You can buy in pots, you know, reusable jars. And then you take them back to the store and they refill them. Or deodorant sticks. It's really good quality. Like, and people get to, you get to empower people who don't want to do the normal job anymore because of Neptune and Pisces to go and make deodorant <laughs> and grow their own vegetables to make it with and stuff. Yeah, Emily, that is so profound because the other really great advantage of Neptune and Pisces has been for us to realize that we're cosmic citizens. We totally, absolutely know that we're multidimensional now. And so once we got that, which actually Claude found 
um, an old newspaper clipping of the ingress of Neptune into Pisces, which happened in December of 2012. And it was astounding to see the event chart, which I have never thought of this. So think about this, Holly, you'll love this one. The event chart of when a planet enters a sign, particularly one of those long-term planets like Neptune. So when Neptune entered, and I, I should have brought that clipping down, um, it was like mass confusion. Mercury was doing something, Uranus were do, was doing something, and when Neptune entered Pisces, um, the writer of this in Wisdom Magazine was saying the ingress of Neptune into Pisces, the birth chart, meaning the ingress of it changing signs for 14 years is mass confusion. That was really profound. And we weirdly found that um, in the um, biology of Kundalini book that we had ordered from um, Amazon, interesting that Amazon is called Amazon, um, as a used book. And someone had stuck that in there. So they must have been reading it at that time. And then we opened it and went, of course, Neptune is like this mass crazy making ingress into Neptune, uh, into Pisces. But at the same time, um, it was 2012 when we all decided that we were multidimensional. I mean, that was when the mass word shift started to happen again. And what really got me going last week was I went back to Woodstock, New York, and when Neptune was in Scorpio, everyone was saying the word shift also. So I watched a documentary about David Crosby's life that David Crosby uh, had, was conducting this very important um, documentary of his life called Remember My Name. And even back then, I'm talking about in the 60s when Neptune was in Scorpio, they were calling it a counterculture. They were calling it the age of Aquarius. They were calling it the new age. They were calling it the shift. They were saying that we're going to be the ones who bring in the golden age, exactly what everyone's been saying with Neptune and entering Pisces. It was like, for me, it was shocking to hear all the same words in that documentary. And at one point, um, David Crosby was with his group. He, he was kicked out of the birds um, because he was talking about the fact that the killing of John F. Kennedy was a conspiracy theory. So he was kicked out of the birds because they said, you can't be talking about conspiracy theories. So even way back then, the word conspiracy theory was, I'm talking 50 years ago, conspiracy theory, the shift, the Aquarian age, the new age, the counterculture, the we are the ones, who are gonna bring the golden age were all the same words. It was astounding to me going, oh, it's really Neptune and the water signs then. That's what it is. And David was um, at some TV production where he was also questioning the different big oil companies back then and that we should get rid of all these oil companies because they're causing greenhouse gases and they're causing us not to be able to breathe and that the air is polluted. So Neptune, hmm, we've got to really figure this out. Neptune is just doing kind of a repeat of what it did in Scorpio, except it's upgraded it like, like Emmeline was just saying to we're multidimensional. I mean, the word multidimensional was not part of Neptune and Scorpio. All the other words are the same. Polyamory, you know, all of that was the same. They were all having sex. Sex was free love. We should have multiple partners. You don't even need to love your partner. Sa same kind of polyamory discussion that's really happening very strongly right now. Um, there were soulmates, all those same things. But the one word that was not used in that documentary was multidimensional, that I am a cosmic. I mean, they, they sang songs like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. 
So they knew that they were cosmic and there was music about being a spaceman and, and different things like that, but they did not have the word that I am multidimensional. That is Neptune in Pisces. Everything else is exactly the same. We're the age of Aquarius. Hair came out and sang that song about the age of Aquarius. Um, so yes, what Emily is saying about like rooting that down that we are cosmic citizens into the material Virgo stuff is really strongly like, let's not miss this because I would say that the whole Neptune and Scorpio counterculture most of those people are, because I was married to one named Kabir Das, because I was with Neem Karoli Baba and Sham Das and Bhagavan Das and Krishna Das and Ram Das and all those Das guys. Uh, had sex with many of them, by the way. Um, but they were part of the 70s counterculture and they were saying that same stuff, but now they're working their butts off because they don't have a house, they don't have stuff, they don't have a car. They are, they've been basically homeless and wandering because they so were the counterculture, except not Ram Dass because he got a huge inheritance. But <laughs> nobody knows like these private details that I know, but I was with those guys. Um, so what, where do you want to go from there, folks? What is coming up for you when I tell you that this was the same stuff when Neptune was in Scorpio? I think we have a... Um... So I think a lot of things came, came, good things came from um, Neptune and Scorpio. And we have the same, um, you know, we have all this beautiful music. We had this big cultural explosion. We had so much creativity and we have that same potential to have amazing creativity grounded into the reality right now. It's not getting pulled to the ends of the spectrum of the polarity where we're either too stuck in the details or too stuck into the imaginative bliss of, of the other end it's finding that balance which is the kind of the key to the opposition um, aspect in the midst of all the other kind of um, interesting aspects that are going on at the time you know it's really kind of also challenged by Jupiter and Sagittarius where which for me challenges for the truth and it is like that counterpoint to all that energy in Virgo and then the energy in Pisces. There's Jupiter saying, okay, but what is the truth and what is your truth? Um, and then of course, in the, uh, that um, gives a lot of potential and a lot of challenge, challenging energy, but that's where people have that opportunity to step it up to say, okay, wh what will amidst all this potential and all this imaginative dreamy stuff, what is my truth and what is the process I am to, going to really manifest that? And of course, opposite from Sagittarius is, is Gemini. And so if you have anything in Gemini, like I do, it's that ability to see perhaps both sides of the coin of the truth, that duality and make decisions there um, and see both kind of the upside and the downside of things and kind of steer yourself on that course. Um, so it, it's a little, you know, so much of that great potential. And, and thinking about the 60s, that is that time of drug use too. And I, that just popped in my mind. And that is definitely something that we have gotten like another wave of. And it's been a little bit even more perhaps intense than the 60s where I think it was a bit... Um, more like LSD and marijuana. And this time around, we've really dealt with the opioid, opioid crisis, um, which has been really tragic in many cases. But I think one of the upsides of that is it has brought a lot of compassion to this kind of idea of addiction and brought to light how, you know, pathways of addiction and um, what we need to do as a culture to look at ourselves and why this happened, why there are, is a great population of people who are trying to escape our, our reality and this amazing opportunity to be here on the planet, which is you know, not available 
um, everywhere in the universe is my opinion. That's my truth. My truth is that being incarnated in a physical body of the human type is not available everywhere. Other types of existence maybe, but not this human vehicle thing. And so to come here and then all of a sudden get that feeling of, I don't want to be here. I want to end it. I need to escape. You really have to look and see what's going on here on the ground. In a kind of a big picture way, what are the patterns? And one of the benefits is, well, the Neptune imaginative thing, being able to look into the mind can do that because we have uh, that kind of expansiveness. Um, I don't know what you guys' experiences with that, but that's kind of another thing that I'm seeing. Yeah, well, I want to hear from Emmeline about whether the 60s and the Neptune and Scorpio was shocking to her because she's a, a little bit younger. So I'm, I'm, but I want to just follow up on there real quick. Um, the whole drug thing was big, of course, that I didn't mention before. So whenever Neptune is in one of the water signs, there's an escapism element. Um, and people who didn't watch our other video on um, the Neptunian unveiling, the best truth that I know it, you know, as, now, as of now, there's a little bit about, you know, the definitions of what escapism is and how Neptune causes that. But that's amazing, Holly, because it's true. You know, one of the most profound things that my daughter, who is 16, who was watching that we were in Woodstock, New York for the 50 year anniversary, and she just really needed to be there. Um, I don't know, you know, I met her father there, by the way, Kabir Das, so that I was with Bhagavan Das. I was having sex with one guy and then started having sex with the other guy. So just so you know what Woodstock, New York is like. <laughs> I'm putting it all out there. <laughs> um, but, and then I also was living with Sham Das to make it more confusing. Yeah, it was very confusing. <laughs> but um, the energy of that whole era, that creativity, that music is very much in Woodstock, New York, because that's where the big concert is. So what, um, Holly's talking about is that if you go to that place, it's like a weird Mecca. Like you put your feet on the ground there and it's very strongly like you feel that creativity. You know what those energies were like. It's like going to the holy land of the Neptune and Scorpio. Was there a lot of drug use? Oh yeah. And back then, it was experimental and, um, you know, it was being put out by Harvard, which is why um, Richard Alpert, um, who is Ramdas, and um, I can't remember all those Harvard guys, but they were experimenting on um, my daughter's aunt Sita, okay? So there was a whole group of them who were part of the Harvard experiments in LSD. And then they went over to India and got into the whole, you know, Maharaj groups of um, like the Beatles did also. So the, the era of the music and the creativity and bringing down that stuff to earth was really profound and necessary. Now all those drugs are prescription based. I mean, basically you can get um, any kind of opiate that you want. You can get any kind of marijuana that you want. Here in Vermont, everything's legal. In Colorado now, mushrooms are legal. Um, you can take ayahuasca. You can, you can do anything you want virtually now. So that's maybe an upgrade. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But in terms of us being cosmic citizens and just having this very rare opportunity on planet Earth, it sometimes includes smoking a lot of pot. It sometimes includes what is it like to be a heroin addict. And David Crosby talked a lot about being a heroin addict, having hepatitis, dying several times from heroin, um, having eight different stints put in his heart because he's a Leo, so it was all about the damage to his heart. Um, the use of cocaine, the damage that he did to other people because he was using those drugs, but he had a very uh, bigger picture of that he couldn't have he couldn't have come to this planet and not do, done those things. So he was asked, could you have come and, and had a normal family life 
with two kids in a nice little ranch house and not had the, mu the music and the drugs. And he was like, not the music and the drugs? Nah, I couldn't have done Planet Earth then. I couldn't have done it. I was like, wow, that's so pro profound because a lot of like coming to Planet Earth, it may include those other things. You know, you can't really get like all strung out on heroin uh, in the Pleiades. You just can't. Did you know? <laughs> so planet Earth is that really incredible opportunity. So let's celebrate every bit of like that embodiment that's happening right now. Emmeline, I really want to hear from you. Did you know that in the 60s, we thought we were bringing in the golden age and the age of Aquarius then too? <laughs> no. <laughs> that's huge i mean that just it just goes to show that it's really a theory that's based on the the time of you know where whatever time pocket you're in it doesn't have to be like this is i mean like you say about neptune the messiah that for me it's very similar and your blog was amazing about the 5d matrix because it doesn't like whatever group you're in like you always there's always this potential for it to go you know large scale messiah or religion phase isn't it and and so that's the same thing it's like we have the age of aquarius or we have the age of the golden age of gaia and that can become like we are our own salvation of, like we're going to say like it's kind of a bit the fact that we need to save something is weird because then we have to we, we have to like strive to do something for someone else rather than just be our own expression um no, no, I didn't know that. That's pretty crazy. Um, I'm just wondering about Neptune and what Holly was saying about the drugs. Yeah, like the escapist drug nature of Neptune. Um, I'm wondering about like kind of the illusion of, so the kind of hidden addictions that we, you know, the subconscious addictions. So it's like, okay, so we have stuff burning like the Amazon rainforest burning and then Amazon, the company, you know, and it, so it's like the illusion of we're addicted to buying things, materialism. Um, we don't really realize that we're addicted to it because we're stuck in this kind of idea of what reality is. So the Amazon burning is like, yeah, but you're, that isn't reality for the, most of the world don't live in the West. So it's not like, that isn't what it is. Can you come back to indigenous communities have been in the head, like if have been on the news, indigenous communities, like they're never really that majorly, but now it's like support the indigenous communities in the Amazon to reclaim their land. They're losing their land. Like, um, so you've got like, and then, so someone was talking about beef and the land being um, cultivated for beef farms. So addiction to meat, an addiction to like things that are like mundane, normal things that you think, well, I should have meat or I should have books. But it's like, where do you get your... So I look at getting used books when I buy a book because I don't want to print a new book. Like, I'm just going to read it and then give it to someone else. What's the point? Um, um, yeah, like food and the way that we produce food like, worldwide. Um, is that an addiction that we're getting stuck in? Like I was, I'm doing a liver cleanse to help me with my adrenals, cope with the stress of like transformation and change, but also like with food, just kind of just calibrating a little bit the body. Um, Cause then otherwise we live from our addictions and we don't, we're sort of subconscious to it. Even if you have a clean raw vegan diet, you know, it's just not, that's an illusion in itself that you're, some kind of purist it's like you're not you're still addicted to fat because you eat loads of cocoa butter it's not just because it's cheese done not cheese doesn't mean it's better or whatever it's all like different forms that we paint golden yeah i wanted to hear from emmeline in terms of um you know because i i do see people um restating the same thing that we're now creating the golden age and don't you know that we're just now creating the age of Aquarius and I had this incredible like aha moment after posting that blog about um, how I left the 5d matrix 
which was pretty controversial, but even this morning, I mean, hundreds, if, if, if you know, maybe 500 people have really responded to that. And this morning, Stellar uh, Fairbain, who did the Magdalene Codes and sings all of her music in 432, congratulated me. And she said she, you know, that was absolutely amazing and that she had written something similar. So I know that it's coming to consciousness um, with a lot of people. And Stellar was one of the first persons that also said that, you know, 440 was not that helpful and that for, she could only really sing in her natural voice in 432. So she was one of those people who raised the issues and said, you know, let's have a look at this. Maybe this is not true. Maybe we've got to go back to 432, which is what it was before the 1930s, I think, is when it got changed to 440. Um, but a, a was a different um, hertz, I guess you would call it a different frequency. So um, I wanted to pick up on the fact that uh, Emmeline was talking about something cued me up also um, that Saturn and Pluto are coming. And part of the major grouping in Virgo right now is to get the details down, to be a little bit more frugal, because when Saturn and Pluto come together, which I have been really trying to say since the beginning, that's like the ultimate frugality, okay? Saturn is like super restrictive. Pluto is like, we're going to annihilate everything until you are super restricted, disciplined, uh, responsible, have backbone. The god of agriculture is Saturn. So even other astrologers who don't really speak like I do on the topics that I do have been saying, hey, listen, Saturn and Pluto is some serious like potential end of all of those easy dependency systems. So one of our videos was called, um, is the matrix a dependency system? And I, I would say, yeah, a lot of the matrix is the fact that we are so very easily dependent upon blaming it on the government, you know, blaming it on who voted for who, blaming it on, you know, oh, that politician's conservative. Um, and not doing a lot of my own personal responsibility of how have I contributed to this situation and and i and i i don't i mean i've eaten at mcdonald's i'm sure so i i'm responsible for this situation uh i've definitely had used toilet paper which is one of the biggest uses of the the uh, ancient trees of the amazon did you know it's just toilet paper and paper towels but we're here we're humans we're wiping but there's, there's other things that we can do, like, um, you know, and there's also these little cups that you can use. And you don't have to also be like vegan about it. I'm not saying anyone become vegan about these things either, you know. Uh, do what is appropriate for you because you are here having a earth, earth experience. But I feel like the Virgo stellium is getting the details down for the Saturn-Pluto conjunction. Okay, do you hear this? The Saturn-Pluto conjunction could be extremely restricting while the um, institutions, the structures, the, the backbone of society changes tremendously. And I'm not saying it's ch changing to, you know, the spaceships landing. It could change very well toward you all get your butts out there and, and create some food, like plant some fruit trees, like harvest the beans. I really am more and more, and I've been saying this for years because I was the farm to school educator uh, 20 years ago in Vermont when I brought you know, farming together with education and changed the school lunch system here. I was going, folks, it's about the food that you grow, which then creates the health of our biological system which then creates the health of our mind which creates the health of our planet which creates the health of um, earth in general so when Claude and I decided to go to the job bank this week 
because Claude is done with Facebook. He is done with social media because he has a Virgo ascendant and everything's in his first house going, I am done with all of this illusion. Um, we looked at a job that was about replanting um, agricultural fields into a, a permaculture, meaning that there would be trees and strawberries. There would be nut trees and there would be gooseberries. There would, because all of that grows quite easily in the same field that a monocrop of soybeans grows. All of that can be mixed up and also have larvae and butterflies in it. Like I took a picture of the dill today that had a beautiful larva on it. As long as you're not spraying it, you can make permaculture fields in what are currently monoculture fields. So we have incredible opportunities across the board right now with any kind of changes that are happening on the earth. If there is a monoculture of a feedlot a feedlot anywhere, whether it's in the United States or the, in the Amazon, you could immediately make that into permaculture. And then we actually got to the job bank and that job was already gone. Someone snapped it up the day that um, the Amazon fair, fire started. They snapped it up like that. So then I was like, Claude, you know what? You and I are skilled enough that we could start our own consulting company about how to make permaculture. Claude, you and I have been doing this for years. We can have a consulting company about how to take a monoculture field and turn it into a permaculture situation. There are so many incredible opportunities from any crisis that happens. And Earth is one of those places you get to play in those material realms where you can't just instantly manifest some, you know, 5D type of milkshake you know, when you're 5D folks, you'll just be instantly manifesting milkshakes. So we're not there. Okay. <laughs> we're still here in this beautiful um, terrestrial environment where we have to grow the blueberries and we have to grow the food for those. And you can see what's drying above me is sage for the winter and all the canning that can happen. It's fabulous fun to do. So we still easily have um, 15 minutes. What have we not discussed that we really need to get out there in terms of the stellium and Virgo? Well, one thing I've been thinking about is how this really prepares us for when we go into the next sign, which is Libra. Um, and Libra is square to the nodes. So when I had looked at the chart, one of the things that I was looking at is with you know, Mars going in first, which is kind of like a, an upgrade or a grounding of those like Mars survival kind of first chakra issues. And then Venus comes in, which is how we relate, how do we experience sensuality in the physical, how do we do artistry and um, communication. And then the sun comes in, it's like, okay, well, we, how our ego, how our ego is transformed by these things, who we are, who our identity is. And then the kind of the last two to come in are of the, of the, like the ancient planets are, um the moon and then mercury which rules virgo and it's sort of like the last one to enter or comes in kind of in with, with the moon although the moon moves faster is like our our emotions are really getting grounded into those em, em, emotional details and then here comes mercury and this is this is his sign one of his two signs but this is his sign where he's really strong and he's, everybody's there and he has all this energy and it just like kind of supercharges um, everything for Mercury and how we see the details and how we kind of experience reality through, through the mind, through like the tangible, for me, you know, Mercury is sometimes how you manipulate things with your hands and how we, how we do that kind of work. 
um, and how he then Mercury is now, you know, normally a very small planet that moves really fast, but he is kind of in that spotlight place where he's very strong and in a square with his father, Jupiter, who's also very strong and Sagittarius and how those two have a conversation about the details in the big picture and the details in the big picture and how that relates to Neptune and Pisces, which is like the cosmic picture in the cosmic dream in, you know, Mercury is a little bit more of, this is the details. This is what's good, what's right. How does this work? What is this? And then that cosmic dream of, Bob, but it's all an experience. You get to pick your experience. And um, so that it is, even though it seems a bit anxious and unknown because there's so much energy in like big picture places, how do we get those details and how do we not feel so compressed because of all this energy in an already kind of very focused place, but it's kind of like uh, looking through a microscope where you're having your bigger perspective and looking down at the microbes moving around or going the opposite way with the telescope. And then we just have that potential to go from little to big and big to little um, and have it affect us on like the energetic because each of those planets is relating to a chakra and in the physical body and then how that goes out into our world that it is this is a very amazing um, just end of our summertime you know in this summertime at least in the normal northern hemisphere is this time of harvesting you know, we've been picking things in the garden. So what, what do you want to harvest? And that's one of the questions that are coming up from you. What is this harvest that I want? Because soon we'll be picking everything and then planning for next year. That's my thoughts. That is so well said, Holly. That your brain is incredible, I'm telling you. Uh, geez. Well, so let me just pull it together as a Libra and Ascendant who just wants to see all, th all sides of it and, and talk about it. Um, Mercury and the moon will come in on the 29th and the 30th. So if people are wondering when this is gonna happen, um, the 29th and by the 30th, we're gonna have the full stellium. Everyone's gonna be in there, okay? Very personal planets. That's the important thing. The very personal details, the very microscopic looking at it. So Mars, Venus, the sun, Mercury, the moon, Juno too. So, you know, there'll be asteroids in there too that we'll, we'll probably pull up around that time, more of them. But the very personal microscopic, like looking at the details of how to do this earth life and be materially secure because Virgo really cannot do not materially secure. Whereas Pisces can go, oh, I'm just going to live in my car. Just going to live in my car this winter. Really, actually, that's Pisces. Pisces is like, I'm going to live in a garden shed, probably. And Virgo, because I, I do a lot of charts, folks. So I got a lot of experience on who's who and what, what goes on. <laughs> but Virgo's going, no, we really need to get the wood in. We need to get the microscopic perfect seed to plant so that next year's harvest is really profound. That's Virgo. Pisces is going, you know what? That's probably going to be a major stargate happening and everything will be fine and then jupiter is going you better get honest about this like jupiter's going the big god is either going to send a boon of good luck towards you or jupiter is also the one that curses you because you were dumbass hate to say it but jupiter's sitting on my son right now <laughs> Don't be dumbass, folks. You got, you got, really, you got to plant the, you got to plant the right seed, cultivate that right seed to harvest what seed you have sown. 
because when Saturn, the Grim Reaper, comes along by January in the middle of winter, this is what I'm seeing. Try and get this metaphor. The Grim Reaper's coming. It's going to be like January 12th, and all of that, all of those planets, okay, with the the Sun and Mercury and the Moon and Saturn and Pluto are going to be con conjunct in Capricorn. Going, did you plant the right seed way back there? And on August 30th, did you put the right seed in for the harvest, folks? You understand? You're feeling it? Emmeline, what do you want to say? Um, yeah, it feels like, as you're speaking, it feels like that, you know, I can feel it. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> But I, uh, I feel like I've been feeling this for all year. <laughs> and, you know, like, like we were talking about before, and for me, it's the Saturn on Pluto now, my natal Saturn, and it's like, oh, time is really up. It's really time. Um, but yeah, so I just think, I was just calculating, that's like five months away from now. So it's like, what have we been planting in, this summer and <clears throat> what can we go on to continue to do and um, I, I, I feel like being present in the moment being present and all of this is really important because it's like there's this fear of the time thing especially with Saturn and so it's like I need to do this I need to plant the seed and then it's like but I have I got enough time but have I got enough this and and then you can go in a frenzy and and you know, how can we choose? Because being responsible for something is then meticulously with Virgo organizing the time frame. So how can I do this with my other job doing that and my practical responsibilities here? So it's really like being able to um, be really solid and like in the root chakra to be present in time so that it's not running away with us otherwise we feel panicked and like our adrenalines are going crazy because we don't know how to cope with, with that which i guess is why we'd want to exit through neptune and, and pisces because it's like it's too much i want to exit um but then like you say <laughs> jupiter is like <laughs> no like with the loving the benevolent wisdom because it's that loving wisdom isn't it of holding you and keeping you that kind of fatherly embrace of keeping you safe in this space. Um, so yeah, the taskmaster of Saturn is strong right now, isn't it? But it's it does feel like shepherding us so that we can so that we can be the responsible ones because if we're gonna exit from the support system of the government who give us our salaries until we are retired, we need to be responsible. It's not about then going and being on some kind of hay out someone's pocket in your sitting room chair. It's like, you've got to really, it is hard work. Like I'm working on setting up a business and I'm like, God, this is really hard work. Even if it's just a small little thing. And I, I'm having to really nourish myself, but also take on the responsibility of doing the hard work and combining those two of self care and hard work because it, you know, it's not an easy exit. It's probably easier to go and have the nine to five job actually, because if you're taking it seriously, then, you know, yeah. Yeah. This is, this has been another one of those unbelievable sessions. And, and like I said at the beginning, it's only by talking freely authentically that we can get to this point um, and and my video about being sovereign and not worrying about what people think of you and not being liked like Venus in her combustion with Leo like sometimes we got to debate sometimes we have to be not liked um, sometimes we have to be the battle goddess and um, then we really get to some potent places uh, it's possible that I will continue to be extremely unliked, um, you know, because I'm going to be posting more and more annoying things about beans and corn, you know, and squash recipes. 
but that's what I really see right now. I, I very much feel that that Grim Reaper is not, it's not just going off in me having a nine to five job. That's the matrix. That is the dependency system. Although it's fine to also do that. That's incredibly value earth experience to just go and do the nine to five job and absolutely do it. But at, at the same time, there is a huge amount of creativity and sovereignty that any of us can have. We have incredible potential, just like when Neptune was in Scorpio to make some very fine music, really fabulous, really stuff that'll last forever kind of music. So let's keep, you know, plowing that plow to make sure that the harvest is good. Okay. Anybody want have any final thoughts? I do. I had a final thought about um, an asteroid that is close to Neptune. Um, I don't know if I'm going to say it right. It's T T Harana Waiako, which was about kind of like he was a. I think it comes from the Native American legends, and he was a like a one brother who was very kind of earthy centered and then the uh, he has a brother who's more hostile and competitive and they kind of um were in a disagreement in about like lifestyles and stuff and then i was thinking about that how in virgo we have mars who is that also kind of more aggressive warrior energy and then will in come mercury who is also kind of a more brotherly science-minded agricultural energy and how to kind of bring this idea of brotherhood where we can either be have conflict or we can harness that energy and have debates that are productive and move us forward. So for me, another thing that is happening with all these planets in Virgo is the opportunity to have a lot of conversation and debates and this, instead of having rivalry, have productive conversations. That was the only thing else I wanted to mention. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll we'll wrap it up. If it, it feels very um, Virgo details, like a lot was said today, and I I really appreciate you both coming on. Anyone who wants to make comments of uh, yeah on YouTube or when we post this on Facebook please do and please like look at the blog that we we referred to um, about my own experience um, and then make comments on anything you want us to talk about in the future i i want to hear also the people who watch these videos what do you want us to talk about or discuss okay so thank you all and we'll close for now <laughs>